Hi, in this video, I'll explain spike recoveries, including what it is, some example calculations of how to do a spike recovery, and then also how to plan your own spike recovery. So what is a spike recovery? There are a couple of things that you can spike. The first thing is that you can spike your sample. And one of the reasons why you might want to do this is to detect matrix effects. In this case, what you're asking is, does this calibration curve that you've made um, actually match your sample? Is it valid for your sample? And I have a whole other video about matrix effects and standardization methods. So in matrix effects, what will occur is that maybe your sample's components other than the NLA are different from what you made your calibration curve from. On the left-hand side here, we have two curves. One of them is your calibration curve, the black curve. And the other one is actually the real response of the analyte in the sample, and that's blue, and in this case, it's groundwater. But you wouldn't actually know that, okay? So the question is, what's going to happen if you have this black curve as your calibration curve, but your sample actually behaves like the blue one? So in a spike recovery, you first will measure your sample. Um, there's your blue dot there. And then you're going to add a known amount of analyte to the sample, and that's called the spike. And what you would expect is that by increasing the concentration this much, that you would get a reading where you would think on the calibration curve. So that's our green dot. So that's like the good scenario of, I increase the concentration and the actual apparent concentration occurs to be the same. But in this case where you've got a much lower slope for your real sample with its real matrix, what would actually happen when you added that much um, for chlorate analyte in this case, is that you'd get only a really small rise. And so the actual concentration is where the red dot is right now. But with that tiny rise and with this calibration curve, you would see it by putting it into the calibration curve as if it's that left-hand red dot, okay? And so in this case, your spike recovery would be very low. You wouldn't get the amount of signal back that you would expect for this analyte. The other reasons that you can do spike recoveries are to study how stable your sample might be. So if you spike it when you collect a sample in the field, um, that spike should still be the same concentration later on when you get it back to the lab. And then you can also spike blank samples, and you usually do that to see if your analytical procedure is performing as it should. So the spike identity and the spike recovery equation. I want to reemphasize the spike is the analyte. You are using the exact same molecule as you're trying to analyze. And the goal here overall is just to see how the analyte responds in the matrix of the sample. The equation that we're going to do, percent recovery, it's the concentration of the spiked sample minus the concentration of the unspiked sample over the amount that you added times 100%. And if all goes well, you should get approximately 100%. You should measure as much as you put in. How close? Well, there's always a little bit of room for error, and it totally depends on your needs. Maybe 5% or 10% off is okay, maybe less. Um, and if you're spiking a sample and you get a bad spike recovery, so I don't know, more than 130, you know, like, oh, okay, that's really bad. Or maybe you get 5% recovery, like in the last one, then you should go and see my standard edition videos. And I'm laughing here because my one cat is trying to get my attention. Okay, so there are two spike options. The first spike option is what I will term the constant volume or the split and spike. You are going to split your sample into two portions, and then one of those portions is going to be spiked with a certain amount of your standard. And when you measure that sample, you're going to call that concentration C spiked. And then the other thing is that you'll add the same amount of water or whatever solvent your spike might have been in to the other portion. That way they're both being diluted the same. One gets the spike, one gets something that's kind of neutral, has no analyte like water. And that concentration is going to be C on spiked. Now to contrast that, we have the variable volume. Um, which I call the read spike and read. So you take your sample, the original sample, you just measure it straight up without doing anything, and you get C unspiked. Then you spike that sample with a small volume of the concentrated standard. And that part's really important because in this one, you don't want to dilute your sample very much by the spike. Um, it's going to increase the volume a little bit, thus the variable volume term, but you don't want to dilute it very much. And then you're going to measure that spiked sample again, and you're going to get C spiked. So the contrast between these two is that with constant volume, both halves, the spiked half and the unspiked half, are going to add up to the same total constant volume. In variable volume, you are increasing the volume that tiny little bit by adding the standard to the original sample and measuring that sample again. Okay. However, in both cases, the spike, the standard, 
is diluted by the sample. You have more sample than standard. And so you're going to have to use the dilution equation to get the concentration added because that standard got diluted. And so we'll work through some examples there. But before I work through examples, I want to tell you the pros and cons of the two spike options. So how do you choose? One major thing to choose on is whether your analysis consumes analyte. If you're burning the analyte, injecting it, you can't get it back. Um, even if you're putting it in the cuvette for spectroscopy, it's hard to get it all out of the cuvette. Okay, in that case, you want the constant volume because you don't have to recover the spiked or the unspiked sample. Um, the other thing is what kind of concentration of standards you have available. If you don't have a highly concentrated standard, you can't really do variable volume. Um, you're going to dilute that sample and that'll change the matrix, um, which is not cool, right? You don't wanna change the matrix if you're assuming that matrix of unspiked original sample is the same of spiked afterwards. So if you're doing constant volume, you can use a less concentrated standard and dilute it more. And so in that constant one, the sample is diluted the same in both, but variable volume, you're actually measuring the real sample matrix, not a diluted version of it. Okay, what about if you make a mistake? Now we all do on occasion. Um, in variable volume, a con is that you can't really go back to the original sample if you made a mistake because you've already spiked it. Unless of course you only spiked a portion of it, which would be smart. And then I suppose the only con for constant volume that's really a true con is that you do have more glassware. You've got two solutions instead of one. And it's a little bit more complex as a result. Okay, constant volume spike recovery example. In this case, we have seven mils of sample, three mils of water. You measure it, you get some intensity, you put that intensity into the calibration curve, and what's going to come out is a concentration, in this case, 17.3. This is going to be C unspiked because it just was sample and water. Okay. The next thing then is the same amount of sample, and now instead of water, you have the standard. And then you're going to read it, you're going to get a concentration. That new concentration after you spike it will be called C spiked. So how do we solve the rest of this? Well, the first thing is that you have to go in and you have to get C added. So C added, I had mentioned earlier, you use the dilution equation. In this case, we have three mils of 50 ppm standard and it's going to 10 mils. So initial volume of the standard is three mils times its initial 50 ppm. And then that becomes the total final volume of that sample, 10.00 mils. And then we have this unknown concentration right there. That unknown concentration afterwards is C added. And so if you just rearrange this, we have the three mils times the 50 ppm divided by the 10 mils. And what that comes out to be is 15, right, 15 ppm is C added. Okay, then the next thing is to actually do the spike recovery. So I'll switch colors here. And in the spike recovery, you're going to take the concentration of spikes to so 33.0 minus the concentration of unspiked, so 17.3. You're gonna divide it by C added of 15. And because it's a percent, you're going to multiply it by 100%. And when you plug that in, that comes out to be 105% recovery. So that's good. Okay, you've got a smiley face here. This is an example where the spike quantity of about 15 ppm here ends up being approximately similar to the original unspiked concentration. And so how much do you spike things by? Well, in this case, okay, roughly 100% spike. And what turns out is a positive result if you are saying that it's okay to be within 5% of 100%. Okay, so next example. Now is an example of the variable volume spike recovery. So you have an initial sample, you know it's volume. You're going to read it, get that calibration curve, and you get your C unspiked. Next, it gets spiked with a small volume of a concentrated standard. And after the spike, you read it again, and then this, of course, will be C spiked. So your steps continue to be to get C added. In this case, we have 0 0.05 mils, about 50 microliters of spike, times its 200 ppm concentration of the original spike. Remember that spike is a standard, which is the same thing as your analyte. And now what you have to do is add the two volumes together. You had the 10 mil of sample and you have the 50 microliters of spike. 
which means that that total thing is going to be 10.05 milliliters times the new concentration. And we're talking about the dilution of the spike that you're adding. And so when you solve that and you rearrange, that is going to lead us to the conclusion that we have 0 0.995 ppm as C added. And that's because of that dilution of the small amount of concentrated standard. And then the next thing that you're going to do is you're going to end up getting the percent recovered, just like before. And so that's going to be to subtract the spiked of 8.61 ppm minus the unspiked of 7.84 ppm over the amount that you added, 0.995, that's your C added, times 100%. And when you plug that into your calculator, that ends up being 77.4% recovery, which is not a good recovery. It's considerably far away from 100%. And so in this case, the sample matrix responded such that it gave you less signal. Okay. Now, you understand a bit now about what a spike recovery is, I hope, and you understand how to do a calculation for both types. Now I want to help you figure out how to plan your own spike recovery. So if you're just trying to answer a test question, you can stop now. Um, if you're trying to actually do this in a laboratory situation, you might want to keep listening. So the first thing you have to do is decide what the C added should be. So you have a calibration curve. Maybe it's perfectly gorgeous and linear like the one on the right hand side here. The first thing is you have to start with your concentration of the unspiked sample. Now maybe you don't know this yet. Maybe you haven't answered that question um, by analyzing your sample. And so what you can do is you can um, estimate it. And it should be on your calibration curve if this is going to work. And so for estimation purposes, let's just assume that it's halfway up the calibration curve and I'll proceed with an example of 50 parts per million. The other things that you have to consider when you're picking how much to add, first of all, it has to be that the amount that you spike is going to stay on the calibration curve. You need room to grow. If your sample was already right here, you don't have any room to grow on the calibration curve because spiking it is going to take it and put that concentration into the never never land that you don't know how it responds okay so make sure you're not having so much that you skyrocket off your calibration curve the other thing is that you have to have enough spike to cause a change right you need to tell that it's different and that'll depend on the precision of your instrumentation and how well you're doing it rules of thumb if you know the detection limit go five to 50 times higher than your detection limit if you know your sample concentration, go somewhere between 10 and 100% of it. So you want to double it, maybe up high end. Um, so here I'm just going to say let's do a 30% spike. And so the math here is pretty easy. 0.3 or the 30% times the 50, 15 ppm. So I'm going to proceed forward and show you how to plan for 15 ppm under both conditions. So variable volume spike recovery. How do you get your desired C added if you're doing variable volume? First thing you have to do is you want to choose a sample volume. Um, I'll give you an example here. And so for the example, I'm going to say, let's go with two milliliters. You have to consider how much sample you have available and whether you can accurately measure that because you have to know these volumes very accurately. Now you have to go and get your most concentrated stock solution because in variable volume, you're using a small quantity of a highly concentrated stock. And let's just say that in lab, we have a 1,000 part per million stock solution, 1,000 ppm. Now you're going to have to use that dilution equation to predict how much volume of stock that you need. At this point, you can assume negligible dilution. And so it's going to be, hey, I've got 1,000 ppm stock. I don't know how much of it to add. But I do know that after I've added it, I want it to become, on the previous slide, we just cited to spike with 15 ppm. If you need to revert back for a moment and understand why we got 15, go ahead. But 15 ppm and the total volume is going to be approximately two mils because that's my sample and the spike that I'm adding should be really small in comparison to that. So that question mark there is the quantity that you wanna add. When you rearrange this, you get 15 times two by 1,000. And that should be 0 0.03 milliliters of stock to add. Okay, so that's step one. I'm going to add 0 0.03 mils of stock to two mils of sample. Now we have to do a reality check. Reality checks are super important. Um, 
0.03 mils is 30 microliters. You want to say, can you actually measure that accurately? In this case, you need a micropipette, probably an adjustable volume micropipette. Does this also satisfy the minimal dilution requirement? You don't want to dilute it very much. And so that's an easy calculation, 0 0.03 mils divided by the 2.00 mils times 100%. So by what percent am I diluting my sample? And that is 1.5% volume change. So not bad. People will ask me how much is minimal, a couple of percent, a couple of percent. Now, if that works, you go on to the next step. It's going to be my next slide, and you actually calculate the real C added. But if it doesn't work, right, if you've diluted it too much or you can't measure it, you have to change your goal of how much you're spiking. Okay, So maybe instead of 30% for 15 ppm, do something different. Um, get a more concentrated stock, so you need less of it and won't dilute as much. Or if that's not possible, go ahead and switch over to the constant volume spike style. Now, continuing with variable volume, if it's good, then you have to go back and you do want to calculate the actual C added. So you're going to include the dilution effect in that M1V1, M2V2, and now you're looking at it from a different appearance. So we still have the 1000 ppm stock. And now we know that we're going to use 0 0.03 milliliters of that stock, or 30 microliters. And now the question is, well, okay, What's the new concentration going to be? And that is C added without any assumptions. So C added times our actual volume. So V2 now is not assumed to be exactly 2. Now it's going to be the 2.03 mils, um, where the 2 is of the sample, the 0 0.03 is of the spike. And when you calculate that, what will occur is that you get, as I go to my notes from having calculated ahead of times, C added equals 14.8 ppm. So you aimed for 15 ppm and you're actually going to get 14.8. Then you go ahead, you go through the steps of measuring the unspiked and spiked samples, get those two numbers, they're on top, C spiked minus C unspiked, and then you will put this C added on the bottom and do the math. All right, last thing, planning your constant volume spike recovery. So you still have to decide on C added, go back to that slide with the calibration curve. We decided we want 15 parts per million. So now what you have to do is choose the total volume that you're going to be diluting up to. Um, make sure you can measure it accurately. I'm going to just arbitrarily decide on 10 mils. Then you need to go get your standard stock solution. It's probably less concentrated if you're going this route. So let's just say I have 100 parts per million ppm. Then you're going to use again the dilution equation, figuring out how much that standard was diluted. So we have 100 ppm, getting a little lazy with decimal places here, but 100 ppm. And well, do I put the 10 here? No, that should be a question mark. I need to know how much of it to add to get the 15 ppm desired spike level in a total volume of 10 mils. Okay. And then when you calculate that out, you're going to get, of course, that this leads to 1.5 mils of stock to add. You get that by the 15 times 10 over the 100. Um, and then you do a reality check. Can you measure that accurately? Yeah, you can probably measure 1.5 mils accurately. How much sample is this going to take? Um, if it's 10 mils total and 1.5 of the 10 is the spike, then that leaves eight and a half for your sample, but you have two samples. One of them is the spike, one of them is the unspike. So make sure you have that much solution. If you don't, go back through and revise this process. And then also think about whether your sample is being concentrated. Think about the concentration of your sample is being diluted a bit by this. Um, so if you're calculating that out of 10 mils, you need nine mil of it to be stock, then oh my gosh, now you have one mil of sample and it's not anywhere near as concentrated as it was before. So that's an iterative process. All right, I hope this was helpful, and I hope that it helps you um, understand, calculate, and do spike recovery. Thank you. Bye.